This week on Arizona Illustrated, the Colorado River Delta, five years after. You come to the Delta and people really collaborate with each other from both sides of the border in this project. Artist Xin Yu Zhang. You don't know what's going to happen. Not everything is uh, so sure. I think that's a good feeling. Gabriel Shrin, seizing the day. I'm an encyclopedia about music, so if you have any music questions. I like that. <laughs> and from far afield, these streets. These streets have held mothers who were awaiting to give birth to children they were already proud of. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, and I'm standing here in the Santa Cruz Riverbed near River and Campbell, where come the monsoon season, the waters will surely flow through here. But right now and for most of the year, it's dry as a bone. You know, water and drought have long been a concern and a point of public discussion here in the Southwest. The issue goes beyond agriculture and drinking water to the restoration of natural habitats. We went to an area in Mexico where the Colorado River used to flow and where scientists and communities are working together to bring back the Delta. This is the last dam on the Colorado River. From here on, there are no more dams. But of course, pretty much from here on, there's any more water either. Five years ago, here at Morelos Dam, the gates were opened for really the first transboundary environmental flow, I think anywhere. And what that flow, called the pulse flow, was intended to do was to try to recreate some of the spring flood that happened down here before all the dams were constructed on the Colorado River. You could really call it a big landscape scale experiment. We wanted to find out how many trees and other vegetation would spring up. And we wanted to find out, was that enough water to reach the, reach the Gulf of California? I lost my bet. I didn't think it would. Other people did, and they won. I saw the pulse flow in action. It was really exciting because my husband had our son in a backpack. So we, the three of us were like trying to find the little stream moving forward. It was by the sunset that we got to be there, and my son was playing in the sand and seeing the water moving, and it was amazing. Para las comunidades de la región fue una fiesta. Eh, durante el tiempo que duró el flujo pulso, los medios de comunicación locales, la ciudadanía, eh, las redes sociales, no hablaron de otra cosa. Y sobre todo fue muy bonito que la gente reconociera que el río Colorado forma parte de la identidad de todos los habitantes de esta región. One third of the water comes from the NGOs who buy or lease water rights from Mexican farmers. One third of the water comes from the U.S. side. And one third of the water comes from the country of Mexico. This is a bi-national project. Uh, and in a time when you know, you'd think tensions between the U.S. and Mexico would be high, you come to the Delta and people sort of really collaborate with each other from both sides of the border in this project. Okay, cool. yeah. What we've been doing is some repeat photography where we've reoccupied some sites where photographs were taken of the landscape just before the pulse flow in 2014, just to see how much it changed in the past five years. And also as a record of sort of conditions today as a way of telling us five years from now how much things might have changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think can be challenging sometimes to find the exact location, especially because we're using GPSs that have some error. Also, there were markers set up, but it's really hard to keep your markers in these areas. <laughs> En este momento están en el sitio de restauración Miguel Alemán. Toda esta zona era una zona donde era un antiguo meandro del río Colorado. Aquí la gente, los pobladores, venían a esta zona a pescar. Después venían también a hacer actividades recreativas con sus familias. Y bueno, dejó de correr agua por esta zona, por lo tanto, toda la vegetación nativa se secó, lo que quedó fue pura arena y pino salado, que es una especie que no es nativa de la región. Muchas de las poblaciones, de, particularmente de aves y de peces, se, sus poblaciones se han reducido y en algunos casos se han extinguido. El esfuerzo de plantación de 2014 a la fecha es aproximado a 100,000 árboles y las, la superficie que se ha restaurado al día de hoy es de 100.5 hectáreas. The delta is along the Pacific Flyway, a major migratory pathway. So sometimes I say if you're a duck hunter in North Dakota, you should care about the delta because your ducks come through here and they stop here and they, they bulk up, they feed and they drink, then they fly further on. So it's not just a local issue. It's regional and a pretty large region at that. Antes del, del flujo pulso, teníamos una abundancia de 40 especies. Ahorita ya estamos un poquito más de 100. Y eso sucede en casi todos los sitios de restauración. Es muy importante también la, la parte de los beneficios sociales que genera la restauración, porque de, Gran parte de la derrama económica de los esfuerzos que se, que se generan de este trabajo, pues quedan en, 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 en San Luis Río Colorado y en su valle y también generamos importantes fuentes de empleo para los pobladores de las comunidades cercanas. We're at a site called Yanitzio, and it's a site that Pro Natura plans to use in the future for restoration purposes. What we're looking at here is actually an old meander of the Colorado River. It's been completely dried out. And the reason we're here is to sort of record what this place looked like before the restoration activities began. In about five years time, my hope that this is going to look like the Miguel Aleman site that has five years of growth of cottonwoods and willows, basically a wall of green in the middle of this dry plain. I started studying the Delta in 1992 when I visited some sites in the northern Gulf of California. And the students and I were along on that trip just exploring and we found these beaches that were just made up completely of shells. And one of the most puzzling things we found, or didn't find, I guess, is we couldn't find very many live individuals of the species that we were finding as dead shells. And we couldn't figure that out until we realized the whole environment of the upper Gulf of California had changed. The salinity of the upper Gulf had gone up and this species liked fresher water than, it, than is there now. So I gradually became part of, I'll, I'll say, the Delta community and one of the attractions really uh, of the Delta community is I really like all the people. And I like working with a project of this scale that I would say 20 or certainly 30 years ago, nobody thought was possible. We are in the middle of Laguna Grande restoration area and it has more than 700 acres of riparian forest. This is cottonwoods and willows, and it's the densest and largest riparian forest along the river in Mexico. If we look around, all this forest wasn't here five years ago. 
Mexicali, which is the closest city, is a large city and it's mostly industrial. So kids and people are used to being inside. And when we bring school kids here, even when they just step off the school bus, it's a very big surprise. And we've gotten kids from the normal excitement, like saying, wow, what is this place? To kids crying. We are planting a little seed of curiosity to be in touch with nature again. When you look at the actual amounts of water that are being delivered here through this agreement, compared to the amounts of water that go to agriculture in the United States or agriculture in Mexico, to cities in the U.S., to cities in Mexico, this is really a teeny little drop. And that teeny little drop is doing an enormous amount of good. People ask me sort of how much water would it take to restore the Delta? And I have to turn the question around and say, well, how much nature do you want? That's a societal values kind of question. The whole Delta is not going to be restored simply because agriculture is too important. The cities are too important. But I think we can afford enough water to restore a ribbon of green from the border almost to the Gulf. La restauración es posible si hay capacidad y voluntad de los gobiernos acompañados de la sociedad civil, si es posible poder sentarse a buscar una solución en la cual pueda ser considerado el medio ambiente una parte fundamental. When you enter a crowd downtown or in a park or on the beach, what enters your mind? Do you consider your relationship to others and the environment? Local artist Shin Yu Zhang considers these elements in our increasingly technological world during her exhibit, Wander Around at UAMA. When I do my painting, I like escaped to some place. I just forget everything. It's just like go to another world. I worked at a publishing house in Beijing, China as a graphic designer. I apply and uh, was accepted into an MFA program at UA School of Art. When I decided to go to another country, a lot of people like, why? I just want to see another world. I don't want to stay in one place forever. You cannot see none to skip like here, anywhere, it's beautiful. I've been watching them every year. This year, I decided to have a basket for them. I think they're safer. In the morning, before I go to work, I say hello to them. When I back home, the first thing is to go there to say hello to them. I enjoy off from kids, but I did not do it. Late 30s, I found what I really enjoy is art. So I studied later. This show is called Wonder Run. I ask myself to draw objects each day after work digitally use Photoshop and the illustration to draw one thing. I started to pin on top of those digital images. I do so because I want to compare. Later on, I transfer to the abstract landscape. I think deeply how the technology changed the human life not only art making process. A 
A university museum is one of the portals, really, that connects the community with the university. This show is by Shin Yu Zhang. It's called Wander Around. This is a show that is timely. It's something that really everybody can relate to because it focuses on what is the, the balance that we need to strike with technology in our lives. This technology affects us almost every minute of the day. When you walk into the show, it's very visually striking. You know, the colors are brilliant. The images are really crisp, you know, and that's certainly the, the method that she's using, combining um, digital media along with acrylic paint. Once you delve in deeper, you know, and you look at the miniature figures and, and you see what activities are happening, you know, you realize that these figures are sort of interspersed in this digital world. And if you think about that in a metaphorical way, that's really where the connection happens. Exhibitions evolve. As the show started developing more, you know, Shin Yu had said, you know, I'm, I'm considering adding some sculptural elements on these paper pieces. I just said, you know, can you elaborate more on the relevance to that? She's made the great connection, you know, which again is relevant to everybody's life, but also deeply personal for her because she has done book design and graphic design. I design books and the magazines and witness the changes. So magazines and books become a very beautiful material and also an intimate material to me. You don't know what's going to happen. Not everything is uh, so sure. I think that's a good feeling. I work uh, by myself. Most of the time, now I feel I have an uh, opportunity to show it to everybody and get feedback. That's very important to me. I benefit from doing art a lot. It gives me a freedom beyond your real life. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about the show and what's happening in our community. Carpe diem, or seize the day. You've probably heard that phrase before, meant to inspire us to engage life with passion and joy and make the most of the present because you never know what tomorrow may bring. Well, now we introduce you to a University of Arizona senior who is doing just that. My name is Gabriel Sharon, and I'm studying chemical engineering. Calculating the difference between our predicted gammas and our experimental gammas. On the rods, we have bare wire thermocouples that are embedded in epoxy so they don't touch the metal. And I'm also studying piano performance. Finding whatever it is in, in the moment that I really connect to, that inspires me, that makes me feel alive. That's, that's what I want to be doing. I started wanting to become an engineer when I was about six or seven living in Idaho. I had a cousin 
who was an engineer at one of the labs there. And I was inspired by his responsibility, his, his ability to provide for himself with such a stable career. And later on, when I was in middle school, I became so passionate about music and I wanted to give everything to it. I can talk a lot about music, like I'm, I'm an encyclopedia about music, so if you have any music questions. I like that. <laughs> I've kind of ended up finding a balance between engineering and becoming a, a concert pianist. I discovered knitting when I was in elementary school at a Waldorf school in Prescott. In fifth grade, knitting was mandatory for everyone, girls and boys, everyone. Um, so I, I, had to, I had to go through it. I had to make a very conscious decision to, to pick it back up again. That, that Christmas when I didn't have money to, to buy gifts and I wanted something to kind of de-stress from finals with. Um, this, this kind of sparked a light bulb in my brain as, as a really great activity in, in so many different ways. This year I've discovered the U of A Poetry Center, which is convenient to the music building, a, a nice stroll away. Lately I've been into Mary Oliver and Robert Frost, so I'll look through some of their poems and if there's one that I particularly connect with, I'll write it down in a journal or in my planner, and I kind of meditate on the meaning of the poem and try and connect to it, a way to find a new perspective from all my other stuff going on in life. When I was in my, my freshman year of college, I was in a, in a bike race and I took a very serious crash. I had to be helicoptered out, and I spent about 12 days in the hospital and then a week in rehab, and I was in a kind of coma from the brain trauma, and it was a very life-threatening situation. Afterwards, the doctors told me that it was really a rolling of the dice whether I would be permanently damaged mentally and no longer to function or whether I would recover fully as I have. If I hadn't been so fortunate, I could, I could be a mental vegetable. I believe that the most important thing is like the present. So I've learned that every moment is, is an opportunity to, to live life to, to really, to really feel what it is to be a human, to, to have this life experience, each moment totally unique. And now from our Far Afield series, we bring you local poet Virginia presenting her poem, 
these streets recorded on location in Barrio Anita, Tucson. These streets have long held the feet of those who have been more than overjoyed to be alive, and they have gripped the hands and knees of those who could no longer carry themselves. These streets have held mothers who were awaiting to give birth to children they were already proud of. And they have felt the paddling of kids' feet as they ran with test sheets in one hand and ambition in the other. These streets have bounced back basketballs and NBA dreams. These streets have inclined the feet of two lovers and whispered to come closer. These streets have turned on the lights to lead you home, whether you were happy or sober. These streets are holding me as I thank them for leaving me space. As I thank them and gravity and you, these streets are holding you as you keep your balance beside me and drop your tears in your water bottle because you're all so happy that these streets have held us together, have kept us firm and six feet above, above and said, let's jump. Even when the newspapers fade out our name, even when the houses have been remodeled, even when the murals have been refurbished, Anita Avenue will long remember our order. St. Mary's Road will still sing our song in these streets. These streets and these people will always remember us. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Here's a sneak peek at a story we're working on. What we do touches on so many aspects of the world around us. Carbon-14 measurements are used, it's a tool in atmospheric sciences, it's a tool in geosciences. We identify objects in museums, we help them identify fakes and forgeries. We work for law enforcement and forensics, but we also work for law enforcement dealing with import and export of rare species, antiquities that are crossing borders legally and illegally. So it's, it's just the variety of what we do I find really thrilling. I'm Tom McNamara. See you then.